So in this mini lecture, I'm going to talk about uh, pollination and seed dispersal syndromes in angiosperms. Angiosperms, of course, are the flowering plants and the fruiting plants. And uh, one of the great uh, leaps forward for uh, flowering plants was having directed pollination and directed seed dispersal, which led to the radiation into the many uh, classes, orders, families, and genera and species of plants that we see today. So what are the three most common colors for Corolla? Yellow, purple, and white. Uh, question is why? Why is that so? Well, first of all, why is that asterisk by white? And the answer is because uh, white flowers often have UV pigments that are invisible to humans in there. So what are the three most common colors for Corolla? There they are, yellow, purple, and white. Why? Well, uh, in order to answer that, we need to start talking about pollination syndromes. And pollination syndromes all end in philly uh, for the technical terms to describe them. So entomophily is insect pollination in general. An entomologist is a person who studies insects. Uh, far and away, bees are the uh, main pollinators of flowering plants. But a number of other insects like butterflies, moths, flies, and beetles can also pollinate flowers. Uh, bird pollination is ornithophily. Uh, chiropterophily is bat pollination, and there are still a number of plants, uh, flowering plants, that rely on wind for their pollination, as is typical in the gymno gymnosperms. So why is it that uh, yellow, purple, and white with UV pigments are the most common flower colors? Because that's what bees see. Uh, bees have photoreceptors in their eyes, their compound eyes, uh, that can detect yellow and purple and UV pigments, just like our eyes can detect red and green and blue pigments. So every color that we see is some mix of those three colors, just like everything that a bee can see is some mix of yellow, purple, and ultraviolet. So that's why. Uh, so how do you know if a flower is bee pollinated or if it is uh, adapted for melatophily? Uh, well, you can look at the corolla color, for one thing. Uh, many, many, many plants are yellow. Yellow is far away the most abundant color for the corolla. Um, and because bees see these colors, uh, they flowers attract bees as pollinators. So many flowers will also have nectar guides that are visible to us in purple, if you think about like a violet flower, or they may be invisible to us. They might be ultraviolet, and you need a special type of film in order to visualize those nectar guides, and that's something that we've only uh, learned about uh, in the advent of UV-sensitive film. Um, bees are... Be bees that uh, pollinate flowers exist because the flowers have uh, f made them. Uh, they've adapt bees have adapted from solitary bees. The majority of bees are solitary bees, but uh, social bees, social uh, bumblebees and honeybees, uh, have only existed since there have been flowering plants to provide them with the pollen that they need to make their honey to uh, rear their young. Uh, so you social or truly social insects with the queen and the workers and the drones, uh, they have only existed as long as there have been flowering plants to support them. Uh, and bees have a lot of adaptations to make them uh, ideal pollinators, uh, including their hairy bodies. Uh, as you can see on this bee that's uh, visiting a composite flower here, uh, it's totally covered, totally dusted with pollen. Uh, and many bees will have the hairs on their hindmost legs, uh, their third pair of legs, uh, that have 
these hairs that are folded over to form these structures called corbicula, uh, which they can stuff full of pollen to take back to the hive. Butterfly pollination is called psychophily. Uh, and butterflies have a different range of pigments that they see. They can also see ultraviolet, uh, but they are more attracted to colors like red and pink and purple and orange. Uh, if a flower is butterfly pollinated, typically it's going to have a uh, corolla that's fused into a tube. Uh, the petals will be fused into a tube, so uh, there will be nectar at the bottom of that tube to accommodate the, the drinking straw mouth or the proboscis that butterflies have. Uh, and butterflies are also very sensitive to uh, volatile aromas that are in the air, so many are perfumed. And they also typically have a spot for butterflies to land so that they can stay a little bit longer and collect nectar and pollen um, for a while before they move on to pollinate the next flower. Moths are also a good pollinators. Uh, moth pollination is called phalaenophily. Uh, but while moths and butterflies are in the same order of insects, the Lepidoptera, uh, one of the main differences between moths and butterflies is that butterflies tend to be diurnal or active during the day, and moths are active at night. Uh, and because of that, the flowers that moths pollinate tend to be very different than the, the flowers that are pollinated by butterflies. Uh, because they need to be visible at night, the ideal colors for them are white or some sort of cream color. Uh, the flowers have to be open at night. Many flowers also have a diurnal rhythm well, the, the, where they will open during the day and close at night, but moth pollinated flowers need to be open at night so that uh, the, the moths will be attracted. Uh, another way that they can attract moths in the dark is that they have scents uh, that the moths can uh, uh, be attracted to. Moths also have these long tubular mouth parts, the proboscis, so they also will have a, a uh, fused corolla quite frequently. Uh, fly pollination is called myophily. Uh, and while there are other types of fly pollinated flowers, the most familiar ones are ones that are for uh, flies that are attracted to typically to rotting meat. Uh, flies that uh, lay their eggs in rotting meat so that the larvae, the maggots, can uh, sort of chew their way out. Uh, dead meat being a very rich food source, uh, many flowers will mimic uh, that appearance of looking like meat. So in this flower that you see here, an illustration with the fly is uh, kind of looks striated and with red and hairiness to it, uh, and that is to mimic what uh, meat looks like. And many uh, of the largest flowers in the world are fly pollinated, and they can produce a terrible smell, uh, like the smell of rotting fish or a rotting corpse. Uh, to attract flies from uh, as far as uh, a mile or 1.6 kilometers away. In fact, the largest flower in the world, Rafflesia, uh, which one flower is a meter across, uh, it said that you can it can be smelled from a mile away in the uh, jungles of Papua New Guinea. Uh, so that's fly pollination for you. Uh, birds are can also be effective pollinators. This is ornithophily. Uh, birds don't have a strong sense of smell. Uh, they may have nostrils in their beaks, but they don't really uh, use scent as an attractant. So bird pollinated flowers tend to not have a scent to them. Uh, but birds can see pretty well. They can see bright colors. So the corollas of bird pollinated flowers will come in red, pink, and orange. Um, and the flowers that we have around here that tend to be bird pollinated will have long and stiff curved floral tubes, uh, fused corolla, to accommodate the beak of the bird pollinators. And around here, 
Uh, hummingbirds are our most familiar bird pollinator. In other parts of the world, they have things like uh, honey eaters and honey creepers uh, that uh, we don't have around here. Bats can also work as effective pollinators. Uh, some bats are meat eaters, uh, but the larger bats are uh, fruit eaters. And some of them are nectar and pollen eaters. Uh, bat pollination is called chirop chiropterophily. Kind of a mouthful there. The chiro chiroptera is the, uh, the, the order of uh, bats. Uh, bat pollinated flowers tend to be large in, uh, to accommodate the size of their pollinators. Wide and white, uh, they're open at white just like moth flies are open at night to be more visible to their pollinators. Uh, they tend to be bell or disc shaped like you can see in the illustration here so that a, a bat can really get its, its face down in there. Like moth flowers, they tend to be open at night. Bats tend to be attracted to the smell of fermentation, so they like to get a little bit tipsy. And they also like uh, to drink that nectar, and because bats are much larger than other pollinators, there needs to be a lot of nectar in there. So rather than uh, putting a lot of resources into producing a lot of really thick and rich nectar, they have lots of watery nectar down in the, uh, in the base. So all that said, another effective mode of pollination is anemophily. Uh, an anemometer is a device that you may have seen that is used to measure wind speed. Uh, that prefix anemo means wind. Uh, and in anemophilous flowers, uh, they don't have a corolla. Uh, they may have a very reduced corolla or they may have lost their corolla entirely. Which makes sense because the purpose of the corolla is to attract a pollinator. And if your pollinator uh, can't see you, like the wind, uh, it doesn't make any sense to invest energy in producing a nice showy corolla for the blind wind. So, uh, but the wind uh, is not the most effective, most directed pollinator. So wind pollinated plants tend to produce lots and lots of pollen. Uh, the flowers tend to be fairly small. Uh, almost all of the grasses are anemophilous. And uh, anemophilous plants tend to be the number one cause of pollen allergies. If you think about it, uh, because they have to produce such prodigious amounts of pollen in order to ensure uh, that they will get pollinated, they're putting a lot of that pollen out in the wind and that is what can act as an allergen to uh, people who have pollen allergies. So our next topic is fruit. I think I'm out of time and I'll take that to another lecture.